when Commander is tortured for old war secrets. We're finally going to get to the truth. Even if it kills you. And there's only one way out. I'm taking you bastards with me. On the next Babylon 5. You have transmissions holding. Patch incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. their podcast land welcome to the 28th highest ranked tv review podcast in australia gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices uh we are here to discuss episode eight of season one of babylon 5 and the sky full of stars i'm scott and with me is jesse john emily kevin good night legends (laughs) it's mike (laughs) I'm Justin, Andrew, Nicole, and Blake. For those who are just joining us for the first time, we are a group of both newbies and longtime watchers of Babylon 5, and we are going to do two different segments. The first one, our newbies and the long-term fans are going to talk about the show spoiler-free, not talking about anything that comes after this episode. And then after that, we will jettison the newbies and talk spoilers in the Beyond the Rim segment, which... As you can imagine, for those who have watched Babylon 5 before, this is going to be a long beyond the rim. So prepare yourselves. Let's go ahead and do some first impressions of And the Sky Full of Stars. And I'm going to go with the hater of the haters first. John, you're up. I mean, I I think Jesse might have a claim to that title, too. I don't want to just presumptively just take it uh, away from our dear friend Jessica. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 shots fired. Um, I liked parts of this episode. So I do like, uh, it definitely felt, obviously, without knowing anything else. And we got a big old stinking heaping of mythology coming at us. So I appreciated that. Um, I love the, is this real? Is this, you know, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? You know, um, caught in a land- landslide. No escape from reality. You utter another, another verse we're going to have to pay. So. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna get monetized. Not with our one subscriber and our nine nine cents. Um, but so I always enjoy that trope, and so I was glad that they uh, kicked it a little bit. So um, there were some stuff that obviously, I, listen, I open my can of hate, and you know, talk about some of the crazy CGI, the hilariously bad action. But um, I do like that that uh, that storytelling trope of the you know, is this real? Is this not real? Um, you know, at the end, you know, kind of throwing it like. Is, are we still in? I think, you know, we might be in your head. We might be not like, so um, I enjoyed that aspect of it. So um, I actually was higher on this episode than I initially thought I would be. It's the first kind of half. I was like, I don't, I don't really know what this is going on, but um, I'll also say it and I'll start the shady count. Dylan, shady as shit. Yeah. You know, and this is what I'm, I'm going to enjoy. I, I've told you guys there, there comes a time in season one where uh, our good friend uh, JMS starts tapping the gas and he is tapping the gas, which means some of the questions you guys have been asking for the first eight episodes start getting answered here on out. Now there'll be some, we'll, we'll ask questions that you won't get answers for a long while, but he realizes when he's writing this thing that, you know, he's got to keep the audience coming along for the ride. So he's got to answer some questions and he's starting to do that now. Jesse. Brace yourselves. I'm braced. I loved this episode. Um, this is exactly this is exactly what I've been asking for for the last uh, it feels like two and a half years of my life. So it's exactly um, what I wanted. And you know when it started into into the process where he was in his mind, I was like, this is cool, and this is starting to answer so many of the questions. So this is exactly um, what I wanted. And this has nothing to do with anybody saying that I'm a negative Nancy. Um, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. So, uh, Jonathan Franklin Keneally can uh, be quiet over there. (laughs) Emily, let's go to you next. Um, 
So my first impression was the opening scene when they're coming through the little security checkpoint because they've just gotten to the station and you just see it briefly but you can see the black gloves on the guy and I was like oh another episode of Psycore fuckery what do they have for us this one and yeah this one was actually really interesting it has to be Psycore even though they didn't say it's Psycore there were the gloves there was Garibaldi reading the newspaper and it said like Psycore doing something with like uh supporting the vice president I can't remember the headline but it was about Psycore and acting inappropriately in politics so I was like oh they're behind all this like they don't tell us that but they tell us that and yeah I thought it was really good and we get a little more information about Dylan but Uh, I still want to know more about her. I want to know what happened and if she went through, like, a big change in, like, what she was doing or what she believed. So, yeah, it was was really exciting. So the headlines we got for this one were uh, in sports, zero-G tennis results inside. Uh, We also got, is there something living in hyperspace, question mark. We have home guard leader convicted, Jacob Lester, found guilty in attack on Mimbari Embassy. Then we have Narn settle Ragash 3 controversy. EA president promises balanced budget in 2260. Uh, Psychor in election tr- tangle. Did Psychor violate its charter by endorsing the vice president, which is what Emily was referring to? San Diego still considered too radioactive for occupancy. A new study published by Earth Force Nuclear uh, Regulatory Office declares San Diego, struck by American state's first act of nuclear terrorism over 100 years ago, still uninhabitable for the next 300 years. Then we oh, have special section. Yeah, no Padres. Copyright trial continues on boos- book zap flap. Books download directly into brain. Who owns them? Question mark. And then so forth and so on. There's more. There is a lot more. Such a raw. That's such a raw. You mentioned the in- interspecies mating. I don't see the interspecies mating on my. It's list. definitely there. Pros and there. cons of interspecies mating. Marsupials. Um, oh my god! Again? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> I've derailed. Well, <laughs> we also get to learn a little bit more about the doctor when he has the conversation with Delin, and she asks him about what he did with all his notes on xenobiology that they were going to use to try to create, you know, viruses or whatever biotech um, that would be unethical. And he was like, yeah, I burned them. (laughs) So I just thought that was nice. Get a little more information about him since we haven't really gotten a whole lot just yet. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Kevin next. Well, I enjoyed seeing uh, Judson Scott and uh, Christopher Niami in this episode. Um, Judson Scott was... uh, famously in uh star trek 2 and christopher naomi has been around quite a bit in uh in different roles in in the 90s especially um but yeah the the plot certainly thickens with with this episode and you get answers to a lot of questions that uh uh make things a lot more more interesting i really uh like a lot of the flashbacks uh and some of the uh the pretty good acting by uh uh jeffrey o'hare in this uh i thought i thought he i thought he really shined in this episode Mm -hmm. mike this is one of the first episodes where like as i review my notes i don't feel like there's anything that i've written down about necessarily the like campiness or or cheesiness Mm -hmm. of the show like it's a solid episode from start to end with a really decent sci-fi premise and a lot of world building and payoff all the way back to the the gathering opening movie um just really good all all around um as others have mentioned i think the acting is really a highlight of this one um everybody sinclair did an amazing job acting i think the the two uh night one and night two as they are referred to in the credits uh in particular uh, christopher neem i called the discount fraser crane uh gets inside sinclair's head and just hams it up like crazy but at the same time he's initially giving me this like big ringmaster energy but then dials it back to a place that's like he is he is a snake in human form and he is like hardcore like thinks something is up and wants to get to the bottom of it it's very believable that whole end gig about like maybe we're both still inside he played a fantastic crazy person and left us with a big dangling question um it was a genuinely like awesome 
episode. You know, and I'll give him even more credit. Um, he actually got this role two or three days before principal production filming began. And that's because the original person who was going to play night two, Walter Koenig, got sick. So Walter got... Uh, slid over to another character, which obviously was filmed later, which was Bester. And so they called this guy in and not only did he, uh, as you just said, do a really good job, but he did so in record time and figuring out this part and figuring out these lines, which is really good. Andrew. Oh, also really like this episode. I don't know if it was just me, but night two kind of reminded me of like a wish.com Brad Dorf. Like I was trying so hard not to, look it up and see if it was him or not because I didn't want to ruin it in case it wasn't Brad Dorf and it wasn't so I'm sad but no other than that um the line is still sus as far as first impressions yeah that's all I got Uh, I'm gonna be the old man here for a minute are you saying sus is that what you're saying okay I'm just making sure I I I know what that means to yeah I I know what that means is just I I was trying to make sure that's what you were saying because either you were saying Dylan sucks or (laughs) Dylan is sus (laughs) The Zoomers will get it. Well, potentially both. We'll find out. Potentially both. I will say this, and this is a major spoiler, Andrew. Brad Dorif will be in Babylon 5. Just not yet. Yes. Because <laughs> he's in everything from the 90s, and he will be in Babylon 5. Okay, <laughs> right, Blake, first impressions. So, like you already pointed out, this episode is really where Straczynski starts to hit the gas with the series and starts to connect several of these plot threads that they've started out and sprinkle throughout these early episodes, they some of them start to come together here and really start setting the stage for pieces that are going to come later. You know, I have to say, the first few times I saw this episode, I wasn't that big of a fan of it. Um, some of the acting in it, some of the other pieces, but, you know, rewatching it later and especially knowing some of what was going on behind the scenes now, and especially with the role of Sinclair and what uh, the actor there was going through, you know, you've got this character playing this role of people in his head. He's seeing things. He's not entirely certain of reality when behind the scenes, you had the actor thinking that the FBI was sending him notes through magazines and that all these other pieces that were, you know, fracturing in his real life as he was filming these particular pieces. But, and then also, you know, I know John, I'm going to disagree with you here. You, you harp on the effects, but The part I'll throw back out is, again, you know, 30 years later in what we've seen developed in the last 30 years obviously blows away what what they're doing. But at the time, I mean, you think back to a standard definition television uh, that they had at the early 90s, mid 90s when this came out. I mean, this was groundbreaking for visual effects for a TV show on this scale and really did open the door for a lot of better effects that would come after it. Um, So I don't want to completely lose and discount, you know, the work they did at the time, even though it hasn't necessarily held up, you know, 30 years later. But that's that's the case. A lot of things you look at original Star Trek series now on HD televisions and you can tell the sets were like cardboard and styrofoam barely held together versus what they're able to put together now. But with this episode, again, like Scott said, and it's already been it really does start to pick up and put those pieces together, particularly with uh, Sinclair and the role that that's going to come to pass also with uh, creating more of that mystery around just what did the Mimbari do and why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to add to the, um, the CGI as well too. Um, this is the most prominent use of space CGI. This show has done yet. It will do a lot more, especially when the budget goes up. Keep in mind too, in season one, the budgets for every one of these episodes, and this is from JMS was about six, $650,000 an episode, which If you look at a Star Trek episode from the same time, so TNG, their episodes were budgeted about $2 million an episode. So it's not even close to the same. Where And by season three and four, where Babylon 5 is doing a lot with CGI, which we'll get to, uh, they were only at a budget of about $825,000 per episode. The other thing I'll do to defend the CGI a little bit, just because John's hating on it, at least he did, is it was actually step printed so the cgi was step printed in order to make it look more dreamlike so the reason why it looks like it's at a frame rate of like five is they did that on purpose and actually um we will see cut scenes from this um stuff again and when it's sped up to normal speed it looks better a lot better so so when they finished rendering it <laughs> yeah well i mean they, they they actually made a artistic choice to make it go at a lower frame rate to make it look more ethereal. I actually think it's, and probably because I'm looking at 30 years later, 
it looks a little chintzy, but uh, you will see this exact same stuff because stock footage is in every single show ever, and it will be sped up to normal speed, and it looks better, a lot better. Justin, you're up. Well, I guess the first thing I wrote down, other than Hans and Franz showing up, and I apologize, I guess we need to refer to people properly as night one and night two. Well, you didn't mispronounce Hans and Franz, so we're okay. Right, yeah, that's that's a win. Um, but the first thing I remember about seeing the chair is I wrote down here in my notes, are these guys going to total recall Sinclair? And I guess that's kind of what happened. I wasn't too far off from the truth, um, because I thought kind of the whole, um, the whole VR kind of mind, um, invasiveness within Sinclair was actually a pretty interesting aspect that we really haven't seen before. And then just kind of, I, you know, completely agree with what was said earlier about like a lot of I really kind of like went back and watched uh, two or three times the newspaper reading when Garibaldi was sitting there reading the newspaper and I almost really think that Garibaldi was like reading that equivalency of like the National Enquirer (laughs) you know it's oh mystery aliens showing up or interspecies breeding but then you see some things that kind of will that we've talked about before about you know myself and I think John's kind of on the same boat about the uneasiness about the earth government and how it's being possibly controlled by the psychor and, you know, kind of how that little bit of it also, in in addition to the interspecies breeding, which was like, like the first thing that caught me because I'm, you know, naturally weird, but I think that there's a lot of things possibly in like some of these newspapers so we can catch them going forward that actually might be worth paying attention to. Um, but I guess, you know, hitting the major plot point though with it is trying to figure out Sinclair's missing 24 hours and how he was, you know, captured by the Membari, tortured. We finally kind of get an idea of maybe what the Grey Council was. I don't know if maybe it was the ruling council of the Membari or if it was maybe like the Section 31 version of the Membari. But either way, Delenn's involved. You know, Sinclair obviously recognizes her and remembers her. And even when he's talking with her later, says, no, I don't remember anything that happened. But in his own personal log says, I do remember she was there. I remember something bad happened. I have to get to the bottom of it, no matter the cost, you know, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm really kind of, that's kind of what had my grip in this episode. And I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of where it goes from there. And kind of now I have a feeling that we're going to start seeing a chess game between, um, uh, between Sinclair and Delenn possibly about how far, how 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 much is Sinclair going to be allowed to remember? Because even in the episode, you know, the other member, I guess I'm assuming is another member of the Great Council, you know, says if he remembers everything, then you have to kill him. Well, then why? Is Sinclair truly maybe a double agent, a sleeper agent? You know, that's my major question coming from the episode is what exactly is Sinclair to the Membari and why? Great. Nicole, you're up. So I really enjoyed this episode. And one thing that I've picked up on about Babylon 5 so far is that the very uh, beginning intro music, the tone of that music is going to kind of set the tone of the episode. So the first thing I noticed off the bat was the eerie, ominous music. And then Blonde Fuck 1 gives the look to Blonde Fuck 2. That's what I'm calling them. Um, and they have this creepy exchange. And I'm like, oh, they are shady. Like, shady count... Hans and Franz, I like that as well. I'm not calling him night one and night two. Blonde fuck one and two is what I call them. But um, I just, the eerie music and seeing that look, I just in the first couple seconds, I was like, ooh, this is going to be a good episode. I just, I just knew it. I feel like they purposely set the tone at the beginning. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just kind of something I picked up on because I'm a music nerd. So, um, but overall throughout the episode, I really liked it. Um, I thought it was interesting because they kind of, Obviously, Sinclair was the main focus, but when that whole security guard uh, got roughed up by the hooligans, like wanting the money and all that and all that stuff was happening, I was like, okay, well, I wonder if he has a connection to them. And sure enough, he's the one that brought him the power. And so I was just like, okay, I see where this is going. So as the episode went on, I just really 
I I was really engaged in the episode. There was a lot of, oh, damn, or oh, no. Like, I was, like, yelling at the screen while I was watching it, um, which uh, I feel like sometimes when I watch a show, I can get a little distracted or whatever, but I was so focused on this episode. Like, I have two and a half pages of notes that I took, okay? So I have a lot to talk about. But overall, the first impression was I just... I really liked it. They really took us on a ride from beginning to end. It answered a lot of questions. It made you really think. Um, and it really kind of set the tone for what's to come, I feel like. Um, so, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Real quick, just to touch on before we switch over to Jesse, because um, we, talk, we talked about this in Beyond the Rim on one of the earlier episodes, because it was brought up about the music. Oh, ooh, do we get to theory. actually bring something up from Beyond the Rim to the newbies? Excellent. Exactly. We can we can finally give them something from Beyond the Rim. Uh, you know, you commented on the music, Nicole, and that's one of the things we talked about to answer an earlier question um, around some of the music and the production choices. The composer actually did try to set the music that he did for the show to the themes in the episode into what was going to happen to try to make the music integrate into the thing rather than just being more random noises and song choices so that that was a deliberate production point yeah so um born of the purple definitely was soft core porn and now this is not so i think that's the one where we discussed the it uh, was it was the, the soft core porn. porn music was uh, born of the purple and also in jms's um commentary for this he actually highlights too that he really wanted some distant trumpets in this as well too to kind of evoke that idea of you know lost glory and old memories and things of that nature too so absolutely jesse um i was just gonna mirror <clears throat> or echo what blake said about sinclair's acting um and as somebody who's worked with people with the schizophrenia diagnosis um i honestly was watching him and couldn't tell if he was actually having one of his episodes or if he was acting because it was legit like I've had clients that straight up will look at their hands like he was and the just distressed look on his face when he didn't know what was happening. I mean, that was like first class um, acting. So loved it. Yeah, this is the the second episode where I'm really doing the exact same thing, Jesse, because as I mentioned to all of you, because it's knowledge at this point now that the Michael Hare was going through a lot in season one uh, in terms of his mental health. Uh, and again, same idea. I was watching this for that reason. And actually, uh, something that is not to the episode, but this is the second time we see, um, Garibaldi's, um, I don't know if he's his second in command, but the security guy who is there, the actor who is helping to, uh, look for the gambler who gets shot off an airlock. He was actually brought on to be uh, Michael O'Hare's dialogue coach, uh, and then became uh, a secondary actor while there but he was also at this point uh there to secretly tell jms if michael was having a red day or not and by that is michael having some kind of issues today so we can be aware of that before we film uh so that's what he was there for as well so it was definitely happening at this point whether it's on this camera or not but it just it's more of a testament to michael o'hare's ability to be an amazing actor going through that Absolutely. Nicole, what do you got? I I do love how um, even though he was confused and in pain and all that stuff was happening, he still like punched that dude and like knocked him back to reality. And then like at the end, like hulks himself out of the chair and like gets up and like goes out. And I was like, I really hope that that's kind of how he dealt with it in real life too. Speaking of the Hulk out, um, the set uh, dresser or whatever, and this came from uh, JMS's commentary as well, did not read the script fully and didn't realize that O'Hare had to break out of his restraints. So those restraints were 100% metal when they were supposed to be breakaway. And he just literally hulked out on them to where if you watch the scene and watch him walk uh, out of the room, you will see some redness and blood on his arm. That's because the metal actually cut through his arm and he just kept going with the uh, the scene. So <laughs> he's pretty badass. I just, yeah, he is. He is a total badass. I that like part right there. I was like, damn, like, I really hope that's how he faces it in real life, too, because the the fact that he like 
still and then when he said oh I guess it's painful for both of us I was like oh get him you know like I was really into that but yeah I thought that was really cool I will say when Sinclair punched that dude and he (laughs) punched him back to reality is such a badass phrase I love it Uh, I did kind of think for a minute we were going to get like a Friday the 13th 3 Dream Warriors vibe going on in this episode that's actually you know um oh Nightmare on Elm Street was it Ah, oh, shit, you're right. It Night- is Nightmare, Nightmare on Elm Street. Street. Three of the Dream Warriors. Facebook never forgets, I Mike. made a damn fool of myself. <laughs> you're all <laughs> fucked. <laughs> That's the uh, last one of you. I want to know what happened to that guy after. Like, would they try to extract his experience from him to get the information that he got from Sinclair? Or, like, what kind of processing would he go through? Because of the... He's definitely uh, not firing on all cylinders. That's for yeah. sure. Because if the behind-the-scenes psychor people were behind it, you know they're not going to let him just be treated normally. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good question, too. Even though he can't remember what he saw, is it still locked in there? Because we know folks can pry stuff out because he just did. Yeah, that was the whole premise of some, them going after Sinclair. Mm-hmm. Yep. He's got a date with somebody when he gets back to EarthGov. Justin. Well, and that's actually like a really interesting thing that's been part of the, uh, brought up that I kind of had a note for later on in the episode was comments were made about how, you know, who who is the who are they going to see? Like, and, you know, the connection with like, is it the government? Is it a shadow government? Is it possibly this whole operation was actually done with with the Earth government's blessing? And even referencing a, a group that we maybe even kind of encountered before with the home what is it home front home guard the yeah 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 with the home guard like so then what is you know so okay so now we're seeing more anti-alien sentiment from these people about oh they've come in they've taken our jobs they've taken our property and everything like that and so now where is this anti-alien sentiment going to end up going is it are were they connected with the home guard or were they connected with the government? And that's one thing that I haven't been able to piece together yet. Mike, what do you got? Yeah, I, I was going to say, actually, to your point, that kind of struck a chord with me, too, um, because, you know, they talk about, you know, when Sinclair pushes back against night two <laughs> and and says, you know, well, what do you think happened kind of thing, you know, like he gives him his whole detail about, well, I think they gave up because I think, you know, they knew they could win, but they didn't want to take the casualties. Why would they bother with that when they could just, <laughs> they got a little bit of like Batman begin vibes when they're like, you know, wow, we switched our tactics to, uh, to economics. We just decided to subterfuge, use subterfuge and start buying up your property, you know, and, and this kind of stuff. And, and uh, it struck a chord with me because it's like, yeah, I remember growing up in the eighties and nineties and, and how there was at least, I mean, it's not like it's gone, but I definitely remember a particular point in time when for a year or two, that was the thing everybody talked about. Right. That's the thing that like, we'd go to grandma's house and we'd hear all the adults like bitching about China, buying up all the property in America and stuff like that. And, And that's very much a very real, real fear that people have uh, about how, you know, our con- countries fall. Right. And, and so that, that was something that stuck out with me. I, I don't know how to phrase it any more eloquently than that. It's just, it was, it was poignant. Along those same lines, this is a second time in just a few episodes where we're dealing with what I would call armchair quarterbacks, people who think that the war went the wrong way, but weren't a part of the war. The last one was Ivanova's ex who Sinclair actually asked, oh, were you part of the war? And he said, no, I missed it. And then this guy, were you at the line? No, I wasn't. So you've got people questioning, uh, you know, you see it today. Oh, if we hadn't pulled out of Afghanistan or hadn't pulled out of Iraq or hadn't pulled out of Vietnam, we would have won. It's it's the armchair quarterbacking. Yeah, there's a real a real arrogance that comes along with that mindset. You know, you have Sinclair who has basically said, like, it bothers him. It haunts him and it haunts other people like him that – the Minbari surrendered and he doesn't get why, because from his perspective, they won flat out. No question. Humanity was done for if that, if, if the Minbari wanted it that way. And on the other side, we've got this joker who's like, Oh, we were going to beat him. No, no question. You know, like they saw our defenses and got scared. I'm like, uh, they were on, 
the battle of the line was at earth. What defenses did you have left? <laughs> I mean, and even he was kind of admitting the fact that he thought we were going to lose. He just thought we were going to put up more of a fight than we were realistic. We're probably going to put up. John, what do you got? Yeah. So continuing Mike's point, or at least that part of the episode, the, the spycraft stuff and his kind of conspiracy theory, like really intrigued me because it, it made me think about two things. The first is, you know, I mean, you know, spies and diplomacy and using spies and espionage, you know, it's been around, you know, throughout all of recorded history. So why wouldn't every race have spies and try to have spies in each other's governments or in each other's, you know, ruling classes and stuff like that. So, you know, if, if the Mimbari had spies inside the Earth Alliance, that wouldn't surprise you. You should assume that they do and you should have counter spies trying to, to negate that. So, like, it was interesting that he said that, like, it was some big thing. And I thought, there's got to be spies all over. But then it got me thinking about the psychor and telepaths in general. Because, again, something on this show that I really wish, even if it was a, a book or an explainer, I, I am desperate to know how they really work. Because having someone be able to read your mind, and as we've already seen through some of these kind of headlines and some of the things, you know, they don't exactly see them on the up and up, is a huge advantage in any given situation. So when it comes to diplomacy, when it comes to, you know, all these interspecies interactions, having someone who could just read your mind is incredible. I still can't get over the fact that in this universe, they have meetings, business meetings, and they have a telepath and someone says something and they go, yeah. And they go, yeah, they're telling the truth. When would that ever, who would ever agree to that? Like the whole point of negotiations, I would never just give you, let you know if I'm lying or not. I mean, that's incredible. So I kind of wonder how that works, you know, in terms of, um, you know, more intergalactic diplomacy. Do you have mind readers? Are they reading heads of states' minds when they're having a conversation? You know, I think about, you know, if the head of the Earth Alliance is having a meeting with the head of the Nambari, are the telepaths reading? Are they battling back and forth? Like, it's that part really, really interests me. So I hope they dive super hard into that. And what happens to the species that don't have telepaths? Like, we know the Narn don't have telepaths. Are they just, like, always screwed at every negotiation table? <laughs> Mike, what do you got? Um, yeah, just to shift topics really slightly, I guess. The other thing I thought was that was really interesting about this episode is the fact that, you know, Sinclair himself doesn't remember what happened during this time period, this 24 hour gap in his mind. And he obviously wants to know too. And so I actually think it was kind of an interesting hook in this episode that at some point during their interrogation of him, that he kind of gets on board with it too. And he is like, yeah, like, I want to know what happened, too. <laughs> you know, it's, I want to dive into those memories and see what's up. And then I think it's really interesting the way that he decides to play it cool at the end of the episode when Delenn asks him what he remembers. and He very definitely does remember her being there. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing, you know, where that goes. Yeah, and I I really do like when we have villains, and these are obviously villains of the week, like most TV shows have. But I like when we have villains that at least come at it where they're somewhat right. <laughs> you know, obviously something did happen. Obviously, Sinclair was involved in it. So what's up? So at least these these villains aren't just twirling their mustaches. They're they're here for a reason. Kevin, what do you got? I think the end was was really interesting. This is definitely an episode that's. Uh... Not not high on uh, government ethics because on one hand you've got a possible you know Earth cover up and on the other hand you've got you know a, a Minbari uh, something uh, ordering Dylan that if she gets any inkling that uh, Sinclair remembers anything to take him out. So it was very smart of him to to play it cool and not not let on at all that he knows anything. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely leads to a, a more uh, sinister conclusion as far as what's going on with Minbari, but it's, you know, of what we know so far of Minbari technology, it's uh, pretty ridiculous that anyone would think that they took a look at Earth's defenses and said, mm, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Nicole, what do you got? Two, two things, kind of to go off of something that Mike said, I thought it was really cool how Sinclair kind of did flip the script towards the end. He's like, yeah, I do want to know. And he kind of went in on the memory. Um, but Another thing I thought was interesting is that he's having these memories of the Membari doing something to him. And then at the end, when Delenn approaches him, he even says she was the only thing that calmed him. And then when the blonde fuck too went to go shoot her, he shot him. So he, even though he was in this state of kind of mania and he didn't really know what was happening, 
he still had like the wherewithal to like not let her get killed and like defend her almost um which i don't know if that's necessarily what he was doing or not but um something clicked in his mind with her and he was thinking oh you know like that i just thought that was kind of interesting how you know he was kind of being tormented by these people in his memories and you know zapped with that staff that guy had and all that and then he sees one and you think he would, I thought, oh no, he's going to go after Delenn or shoot her or something. But actually he kind of saved her and she snapped him out of the the state of like mania he was in. So I thought that was really interesting because even though something happened there and she was directed to kill him, if he remembers, they have a bond that I feel like is really special and like really different. And maybe that they're not supposed to have in a way, not like a romantic thing, but like a, more of like a almost like they they love each other in a way but not like like a platonic way i guess is what i was trying to say he ate the cherry tomato yeah they're married they're married that's right (laughs) emily what do you got uh yeah i kind of what nicole said um i in another episode you know when dylan was talking to a friend and the friend asked about everything she gave up um and then in this episode, so I was kind of confused on the part where he's in his mind and he's in the middle of the gray council. I'm assuming that's what it was. And he pulls back her hood and keeps saying, I know you. And I was trying to figure out, is he saying, I know you because he's putting her now with like that scene? Or did he somehow know her before he ended up in the council and like i see what you're saying yeah was that i know you like he somehow knew her before all of this happened or and i know you because he was finally connecting the dots between i saw you in this place at this time where my memory is essentially gone and like i know you now because we engaged in some sort of non-consensual marriage religious ceremony (laughs) um and I still get the feeling that she's there to protect him in some manner. Like, there's just something there that seems... Because I know the guy was like, okay, if he remembers, you're going to have to kill Sinclair. But she didn't really seem like, yay, I get to kill Sinclair. It was more like, yeah, I'm going to agree to this, but I probably won't do it. She's also the same person who gave Sinclair files in the gathering and said, you didn't get them from me. So she's already breaking right. the rules. Yeah. She's his, you know, she's I mean, basically, the sky. she's his uh, CIA handler. Yeah. A CIA handler? Mm-hmm. She's the CIA handler. Yeah. John. Yeah, so watching the Minbari uh, torture Commander Sinclair, which is, or at least that's what I took from that, unless Minbari uh, BDSM is a little bit different than than here on Earth. It was just Thanksgiving dinner. What are you talking yeah. about? I, it, well, it got me thinking, you know, about torture in the galaxies as well. You know, it was that just the normal part of doing business. Everyone's just cool with that now. Or, you know, when you think about how it's discussed kind of in our current times, you know, here on Earth, you know, uh, especially go back, you know, waterboarding, yay or nay, um, that kind of discussion, you know, I, you know, uh, uh, other species, I wonder, like, you know, if the Narn were torturing people, just from the kind of vibe you get from them, you'd be like, oh, well, of course, the Narn torture people. But the Membari are supposed to be a little more enlightened. So it's, you know, a little more surprising. I wonder if that's something that's kind of uh, known, you know, with them or, or what torture in general, how it's kind of viewed in the in the space. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Justin. Honestly, one thing that Emily said kind of really blew my mind, to be honest with you all. Um you know, was, was the Len actually there? Honestly, like I thought she was, and I, I kind of read into the whole thing earlier to where, okay, this is our first glimpse of the great council and everything like that. But then after Emily said, you know, what she said, I was like, well, you know what, honestly, maybe I'm not a hundred percent sure anymore. Like was the Len actually there or is, was it just, Sinclair's the the mind torture that Sinclair was going through just projecting to lend into that space hmm. and so that's actually kind of a thing that made that kind of made me uh question some of the things that I had kind of observed on my own from the episode so well done um but the last thing I kind of have which is kind of not related 
uh, to anything that we've been talking about is the is is the structure with the Membari is that is that a bone structure or is that a fancy hat? No, that is that is their anatomy. That is that their is their anatomy. Structure. Okay, much like a tusk of an elephant. Same idea. Okay, fair enough. That was like one thing I really hadn't thought about before. Well, I would say to your uh, question about the memory of Delenn, there is a reason why in scientific circles, uh, eyewitness evidence is the worst kind of evidence you can ever bring to court because our memories are crap. (laughs) Nicole, what do you got? I was just going to say one thing that I did notice in that scene um, that Justin and Emily and I were kind of mentioning before was um, when he kept saying, I know you, I know you, when he removed the cloth and looked at her, um, it went on for a little bit. And then the other guy with the staff zapped him Mm -hmm. after that. So I almost wonder if maybe she actually really was there because she was in the great council, we know. Mm -hmm. And I assume that's the great council. I also assume, which I guess I could leave for the questions, but the guy with the staff who zapped him, I think is the guy who told her that, you know, he has to be killed if he remembers. But when he, when she removed, when he removed the cloth and he kept saying, I know you, I know you, it was like ongoing. And then he got zapped and knocked out like, Oh no, you know, like let's get him back on track here and, and, you know, get, a hold of the situation. So it is really difficult to tell if it was kind of his memory or if it actually really happened. So I think it's, it's up. I think it was purposely left up to our interpretation, if that makes sense. Yeah. John. Yeah. So I don't know if they gave an answer, maybe I missed it, or, you know, maybe you find folks can enlighten me on, they showed the, the camera panned and stayed on his hand. He, him kept, you know, opening and closing and squeezing his hand a lot. And I yeah. couldn't quite figure out if there was any other significance other than trying to wake himself up. I just, I, didn't, I wasn't, I was unsure of what that was. That's exactly what that was. And I get this from the JMS commentary. That was uh, him trying to control something outside of the dream world. He recognized that he was moving his real hand. I don't know how, but that's exactly what he was doing. He was, he was trying to keep at least a little bit of conscious effort going while he was in there. The literal grip on reality. Yep, yeah. exactly. Literally. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think maybe it's because of the physical contact, because remember, that's the hand he punched with. Mm-hmm. So when he felt the pain, as he did, he realized, okay, I feel this pain, so therefore this is something that's real. Uh, I was going to say, he just needs to get one of those spinning tops, like Inception, so he can know. He needs this little token. We won't get into the last two seconds of in, uh, Inception. That's probably like a podcast show in itself right there. <laughs> and by the way... It was toppling before the credits rolled. The end. <laughs> Blake, what do you got? And I'm mentioning the part about Sinclair with moving his hand. You know, and this is one of those areas where those of us who have read JMS's book and read the Usenet groups know that, you know, he had so many different plot threads and ideas that would later be overlaid into different characters. Um, you know, ideas that he had at the beginning that he didn't necessarily know who they would apply to or where they would go. And I'm almost wondering with Sinclair, because if we go back to Mind War, when Bester went into his office, you know, Sinclair pretty much said, get out of my head. You know, he Mm -hmm. knew he was being scanned by Bester. And in this episode, when they're messing around in his mind, and he's got that control of his hand outside of the dream type thing. So I'm almost wondering if there wasn't a plan there somewhere with some of the pieces that we'll see later applied to other uh, characters with latent ability. Um, if some of that wasn't at one point also thought of Sinclair as a possibility for. Hmm. Interesting. Sounds like a beyond the rim discussion too. <laughs> well, I didn't mention any more than that. I know you were good. You were good. You were very good. It's interesting. This is probably the most highly rated episode. I think you guys have all had so far, but we haven't talked as much because there wasn't a B plot. This was all a plot hundred percent. This was Sinclair show. So is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we go into questions and predictions? We do okay. need to throw a shout out, though, to our awesome fan, Alexander Bohm, who continues to be engaged and can, continues to be positive. And he's just like a really cool dude. So another co- uh, couple of shout outs to our Twitter fans. Uh, we have uh, Marte- Marteki, who said uh, of this episode, I absolutely love the Knights. As far as villains of the weeks go, I find them super compelling, both in their motive and their implications uh, that they bring about Earth and the smaller factions within. And plus, I love how creative they got with the dreamlike imagery. And then Herald of Creation, 
says uh, it's a brilliant episode and one of the highlights of season one. Did we talk about the like they the night one and two like who they work for like they kind of felt glossed over real quick about like well, there's been there's been some questions in this group about I that. did. Because it, it was mentioned they were wearing gloves, although Psychor, at least the Psychops, didn't have to smuggle weapons onto the station. They just carried their weapons on. So that's one they keep in mind, too. But yeah. we, we did not. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're Psychor, honestly. He said they were eventually working. They're like a, I almost got the idea they were like a covert paramilitary type situation that might be in cahoots or linked up with some insiders in the Earth Alliance government. That's what I took away from it, but I wasn't sure if I was reading into something. So I honestly think that these two people possibly were linked up with Home Guard, but were also linked up with the Home Guard faction within the Earth Alliance government. So like, you know, I guess say a fanatical wing of the Home Guard is what I kind of like associate them with and think that they were, you know... And definitely in in cahoots with some kind of faction uh, within the Earth Alliance of Government that is anti-alien. Blake, what do you got? Well, a nice little comment on the part with the two knights and the psycho relation. I mean, the one thing to keep in mind is they didn't scan Sinclair's head. They were using tech to do it. So I don't think either one were necessarily um, in with the psycho because there wasn't a reading. But what I was going to comment on, you know, Scott, you mentioned there wasn't a B-plot. And I don't think there was a large secondary plot, but I think there was an underlying plot here, uh, kind of a blink and you miss it thing. And that is with uh, Garibaldi's security team, because you can see where they can get compromised. Mm -hmm. And that's going to become a thing. And you can already kind of see where, you know, one member of the team was compromised and, you know, how easy that was to do and to be used for other purposes. So I think it was kind of a really subtle, not necessarily a full B plot, but it was definitely under the surface of the main plot to set stuff up for uh, later with that on that uh, piece. Is that, is that, is that foreshadowing that we uh, don't know about yet, Blake? It's a sci-fi show and you have security guards. You don't think there's going to be an episode in five seasons about a bad security guard? (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. (laughs) And and we'll talk about it and be on the rim, Justin, and you can't listen to it for. We will highlight exactly the episodes. Um, And then along with that, man, um along with that um the b plot that you're completely right that is very much a b plot also tells us that if you dump a body outside of uh, b5 it will gravitate back which by the way makes perfect sense scientifically that's a big station it will fall into a gravity well the body will <laughs> nicole what do you got um one thing that emily briefly touched on about learning more about the doctor uh that i thought was kind of interesting that i don't think we talked about was how he was scanning delen uh, and he had made a point of saying that, you know, he doesn't get to work with Mambari very often. It was really nice to be able to scan a healthy Mambari so he knows how to help them. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting and something to talk about. Um, just something small to bring up. Yeah, we found out that Franklin and I, Emily, I think you mentioned Franklin as well, too, uh, mm-hmm. definitely wants to increase his knowledge of alien species. And he spent several years of his life hitchhiking to do just that so he's continuing to build that knowledge base mike yeah the only thing i I wanted to mention was uh (laughs) that we learned that garibaldi is the only good detective on that police that station because they're already suspicious of this benson guy who as far as we can tell from the editing immediately left being called out by sinclair and garibaldi to go do nefarious stuff like he didn't even stop in his room on the way uh but then later you know garibaldi's assistant comes up to him and he's like yeah check benson out uh you know his financial records look fine never mind that there's this you know fifty thousand dollar deposit like earlier today <laughs> totally fine nothing suspicious he's he's clean in my book and he had time to look into that while the station commander was missing but whatever yes yeah, and, uh, that was, uh, and that was 15k as john pointed out in the chat yeah, it was 15 but yes uh and, and then, a bitch. i do want to mention too i mean um as far as the whole who are these tech guys or the night guys you know their titles were kind of interesting night one and night two sort of implies some kind of weird <laughs> cult like thing although they cosplay on the afternoons they larp yeah i mean well we know the kkk does all kinds of weird clowny stuff too that people would like and they're usually blonde blue-eyed right yeah um 
but then it was pretty weird how uh you know after after we found out that the one dude survived that uh earth also found out and immediately recalled him to try to keep anyone else from getting to talk to him so very uh very suspicious emily what do you got okay so yeah i still think the knights are psychor and i know blake said they use tech um i kind of saw the tech as a way to manipulate his mind not just scan it and like look into it but to actually manipulate it and they had to have him you know drugged up so they could do it because he as we saw with Buster, he recognized someone being in his head quite quickly so they couldn't use like their normal scanning methods they would have to do something else i still think they were some branch of psychor and if they didn't have maybe the full capabilities of other people they're still they're with them somehow. I'm convinced. <laughs> She's convinced, folks. And I will accept being completely wrong on this. <laughs> well, we will say if you are wrong or right, as soon as we tell you to leave. The blonde bitches are either Psychor, Home Guard, something else, or all of the above. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, it wouldn't surprise me if if someone, like, who was messing, like, in the higher up gave the Home Guard their gear was also working with Psychor, so maybe they don't know they're together. But there's a lot of questionable stuff going on, and uh, they need to root that out. All right, let's go ahead and roll into questions and pred- predictions. Questions and predictions for those who know English. Jesse, what are your questions and or predictions moving forward? Um, I don't... I guess my question is I really want to know, because I'm not... Hopefully not the dumb one of the group, I have a feeling I know who it is, but I don't feel like it's me. Um, do I, did we miss, we didn't get the full story of what happened to him in those 24 hours, right? You have not, because even he at the end of the episode says, I have to remember, I have to figure this sure. out. Okay. So I, I didn't feel like we got the whole thing, but like a lot happened. Um, and I, I just want to know, I want to know what it was. Um, I want to know what happened. Well, Jesse, um, I, I will tell you right now, because I intend to do it. I am going to give a point by point of what happened at the battle of the line. As soon as you all leave and we do beyond the rim. Oh, I mean, every single time that comes out of your mouth, I want to punch you through your face. <laughs> like it's like I, you get this some sadistic joy out of the fact that you tell me I'm going to answer your question in five seconds when I, you can't listen. I'm so excited for everybody else but me and the other noobs. Um, but no, that's I just want that's what I want to know. I don't really have any predictions. I I'm I don't think I'm invested yet enough to start throwing out predictions, but I'll get there. Cool. John, questions, predictions. Uh yeah, for questions, uh, a lot of them are basically, you know, you were alluded to at the very end, the commander, the questions he was just asking out loud, you know, what happened in this 24 hours? Uh what are we missing? Uh why is the lens so shady? Or at least, uh, I think it was mentioned, right, is is she really shady or is she secretly trying to be shady against the Minbar because she's in love with Sinclair and her, her husband and, and and all that? Um, but I think the biggest question that has yet to be answered or that I hope you will talk about in depth is um, that interspecies mating headline. Will we get a follow-up? Will we figure out is it worth it? Is there an interspecies Tinder? Can I join? These are the questions I, I must know about. What will we name... The interspecies tender. Uh, Grinders are already taken. Bumble, tender. What what would we name? And and also, what have you seen on this show that you're interested in getting with? Is it the praying mantis? Uh, We had a very long... Is it the gorilla man bartender? We had a very long conversation about Wendy as a Mimbari. um, And I think I stand by that. Uh, But also, I think we should just call it the list. Stick to the list. Honestly, no. Honestly, I would say I would say interspecieshankypanky.com. It's too long. I'm out. Yeah, no. you can't you can't Google that. Much like Gray Seventeen podcast, you can't Google that very easily. Eh, okay. Um, inter interspeciesLove.com. Why Why do you have to make like long <laughs> syllable words? Tender is two syllables. <clears throat> not 15. aliens. Fuck aliensfuck.com that's like 12 why is everything a dot com shit <laughs> shit is one syllable something Good like job. Fiverr or something like it's an app something just very easy just name it something awesome like gash sinclair's sinclair's grotto.com andrew buy it now why do you keep putting dot com this right. is not 
1993. You don't have to dial up. Right. <laughs> okay, honestly. Outside. Okay, I got it. I got it. Abduction. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, abductor. Pro, I'm probing. Probe. Probe. Abductor. Probe. Yeah. Probe. 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 I like Probe. it. Probe. I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a survey on Twitter. Probe. Go to our Twitter account, Gray17 Podcast, and vote. Do you oh. like interspecies whatever Justin said the first time? The probe or any other I'll make a list of them. This is subscriber content. Right here. Subscriber content. Yeah. Yeah. Full, full credit, baby, right here for Pro. Okay. This is 99 cent shit right here. Yeah, you know what? I actually, cent shit. I actually think um, for subscribing content, and for anyone who doesn't know what the heck this is, we probably should have talked about this at the beginning of the episode. We have opened up for subscribers, and we will be dropping bonus information and bonus shows uh, to our subscribers moving forward for a mere dollar a month. You can get more of us. And who yeah. wouldn't want more of us? And for another and, dollar a month, we'll name your app for you and we'll record the process of coming up with it. I love that. Here's actually one of my thoughts for subscribers only is we make Andrew read Babylon 5 uh, fanfic and just have <laughs> oh, that. I'll do dramatic a, readings of it. I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll do different voices for the characters. And then Londo the stroke Jakar's immaculate bald head. I'll do so Scott. We're gonna find that uh fake script that JMS wrote for that one. Oh yes, we can read that. That is the one we will find and make it. Just uh, got a bottle. So, so you <laughs> Jesse, see, you have your hand up. What do you, you want? I want to see something <laughs> sad. Type Star Trek into IMDB and look at the number of fan films that are on there. Oh yes. <laughs> Jesse. I'll, I'll do dramatic re- readings <laughs> of our hate comments for the subscribers. There needs to be a mailbag segment, but in order to be a mailbag segment, we need more mail. Send so, us mail. Send us mail now. Tell us how much you hate Keneally. We feed does. off your hate. We feed off of it. Jesse reads mean tweets for an hour. That's I, I will so do it. And I Jesse, keep calling mean Keneally, but... mean tweets. Welcome to bonus episode number 15. Another mean tweet reading by Jesse. <laughs> I'll do it all day long. For 99 cents a month, Jesse too can read your mean tweets. <laughs> Jesus. Justin, why do you have your hand up? God damn it. I want to get through this. <laughs> this like, what the hell now? Okay, so so for every for every 99 cent subscriber, because that's honestly what I think this will be worth, I will give tickets to my very first drag show next year. I don't It'll know what's worse. I don't know what's worse, seeing Justin and drag or having to drive to Indiana to see it. But you're oh, gonna have to do both. Honestly, do it. Because it's the best of both worlds. I would pay and that is honestly, that. Uh, honestly, the best dollar you can buy. Nicole, questions and predictions. Ooh. All right. So um, my prediction is, is that we're going to see some more conflict or issues that happen w- from this situation with his mind getting interrogated and like all that stuff and these memories coming back. I feel like we're going to see more of that. Um, but a couple questions I guess I had were, um well another prediction if it comes to the point where he remembers i don't think delin is going to kill him uh that is a prediction i there's no way i think she would kill him i think they have too much of a bond um and then question wise um i guess are there going to be more issues or conflicts with people trying to get you know his memories or maybe go after him again in the future about that 24 hours um and then just more um you know are there going to be more um, issues with, I think somebody brought up the security, uh, like what's going to happen there. And then also, is this going to put a strain on the relationship between Delenn and Sinclair in any way? So There's been a dramatic lack of shipping, but I guess I'll take that as shipping of Delenn and Sinclair, as we already discussed. Andrew, what do you got? Uh, no predictions this time. Um, my question is, though is what must Sinclair never find out. Okay. That's all I got. Cool. I guess the biggest questions I have are a lot of the same other people's questions. Like honestly, is is Sinclair a double agent? You know, what is what is his role within the whole thing? And honestly, like I don't still know the grid the nature of the Grey Council. Where are they? Are they the ruling class of the Mabari, or are they like a Section Thirty-One type um, black ops 
section within within the Mabari culture. So like those are the two kind of questions I have. As far as predictions go, um, really, I don't I still don't trust the Earth government. I still really don't know what it's about. It still seems very, you know, my prediction for Earth is actually very poor right now. Because I have I have this bad feeling that something's gonna happen that's gonna actually like trigger even more of an anti-alien sentiment and even a lot of anti-alien violence. Emily? Uh, one of my questions is, does Sinclair know that he's married to Delyn? And how does she feel about his relationship with, um, what was her name? Was it Carolyn, the new one? Oh, Catherine Sakai? Sakai? Yeah, it was Catherine. Sakai. So I kind of want to know how Delyn feels about that. Massive but- jealousy. <laughs> wants to throw it on an airlock so she can gravitate around the station. But really what I want to know is, did Sinclair know Delyn before he was essentially captured by the Minbari? Like, is, I want, because that I know you just seem really vague. And I, I just want to know, like, her connection to him has just seemed so intense and so strong that it feels like she kn- that she obviously knows way more about him. And I just, I want to know more about that relationship. Sounds good. So we're going to go ahead and end it there for our newbies. And as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a lengthy beyond the rim, I think. I mean, don't expect like hours, but we have a lot to talk about because this is obviously a big lore episode. In fact, this is, I would argue, the first big lore episode but before we get into beyond the rim we'll say goodbye to our newbies because they can't hear what we're about to say so until next week when we talk about death walker dun 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 i have been scott and with me as always is jesse john (laughs) emily kevin mike i'm justin andrew nicole and blake Nicole Jesus. fucked it up. <laughs> I, did it on, I did it on purpose. I was like, I'm usually the cheerful one, so now I'm going to sound all bleh, you know, just to be just to be a dick. See what I, I started? Jeez, I'm sorry. I hate, I hate, I hate every single one of you except Nicole and Emily. Oh, Thank just you. wait. What did oh, I Jesse, do? Jesse, I, 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 I didn't do Jesse. anything. Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to this podcast and links to our social media accounts at anchor.fm slash gray17podcast. We want to hear from you, so please join the discussion on Facebook and Twitter. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Gray 17 is a part of the Front Row Network and NPR Illinois Community Voices. You can find all the Front Row shows at thefrontrownetwork.com. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and this podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All audio clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of their respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing Babylon 5 themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. I want to go to bed. (laughs) Me too. God, if you read the entire history of the Battle of the Line, all three of us are going to kill you. (laughs) No, I'm not. (laughs) Audio (laughs) dub it in later. I wasn't going to do that. I'm going to go through a tunnel. That's so what's going to happen. <laughs> Welcome back to Beyond the Rim, where we're going to talk spoilers. So if you have not watched Beyond and A Sky Full of Stars, this is where you need to exit now, uh, because we are going to start spoiling everything that comes after. And of course, the big thing here, guys, is the Battle of the Line, which I jokingly said that I was going to read off a dot point of what uh, happened there i'm not gonna do that because i don't want anyone to hate me or you know stop listening to us i will say though for this episode i did up until this point i have been watching with the newbies blake i know you're binging ahead i don't know about anybody else but i have been actually purposely not doing that so i've only been watching one episode a week but i did watch in the beginning yes today because i felt like i needed to watch that babylon 5 movie to get the other side of it, because obviously this episode we see the 
Sinclair portion. And then in the, in the beginning, we see the Dillon portion. And I think the key thing there is uh, to answer a couple questions right at the bat. What we saw in Sinclair's memory is exactly what happened. So he was taken on board the ship. He was interrogated. They used a triluminary on, which we will talk about in a moment. And Delenn was obviously there. The other key factors we didn't hear about is that Delenn is a part of the Grey Council. That was the Grey Council, and they were absolutely prepared to end the human species at that very moment until the Vorlons told Delenn to hurry and make a choice before that happened, and she was able to grab Sinclair Star Fury and... What we see after that is what we see after that. So what do you guys want to talk about with the Battle of the Line? The part I'll throw in on your analysis there. So it, that is what happened, except for uh, Sinclair did not recognize Delenn in reality. Yeah, yeah. That, hmm, you're right, kind of. Yeah, because he, he didn't say, you know, I know you. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm seeing yeah, the, the I know yeah. you part. That was part of the dream sequence. I mean, yeah. she was there. the rest of that was exactly what happened. But he did not recognize her at the time of when it happened at the Battle of the Line. He did not know Delenn at that point. Yeah, they had no Emily, prior. Yeah, to Emily's question, he did not know her prior. Which I did think was funny just because there there most definitely is a lot of time travel that happens in Babylon 5, and she sort of correctly guessed at that, but not in this instance. Well, and absolutely. I mean, that's one thing I want to talk to you guys about really was the triluminary and all of that because we absolutely have a time loop here. Because the Triluminary was created by Sinclair, given to the Great Council a thousand years ago, in order for the Great Council to tell it's him a thousand years later. <laughs> so there is absolutely a lot of time wonkery going. We just don't know about it yet. What else you guys got? I said this was going to be a long conversation, and you guys got nothing? This one's pretty straightforward with this one especially with the battle of the line you know what sinclair must not be allowed to find out because at this point and they're going to change it pretty fast at the end of season one when they roll into season two i mean lanier is flat out told in season two he goes to the new station commander and says there's things you need to know it's why we surrendered at the battle of the line and is basically told tell them everything but at this point it's still considered you know the Mimbari want nobody to know about this whole humans carrying Mimbari souls thing, which in reality is Mimbari are carrying the descendant DNA, DNA of Sinclair through the descendants of Valen. Mm -hmm. Which actually, adding to the time wonkery, when you watch in the beginning, the Triluminary does, and actually it's an atonement too in season four, the Triluminary glows for Delenn. So Delenn mm -hmm. is a descendant of Valen and... Potentially, they've, was established, they've said that in canon. Have they? Yes. Yeah. So far, what we've seen or no? Like so she's her own what grandma. Not what we've seen so far. Well, but no, because it's not Sinclair. Yeah. It's Sinclair. I mean, it's not Sheridan. It's Sinclair. So she didn't bone Valen that we know of. They they do establish at some point in this. I can't remember where, but they do establish that she is a descendant of Valen. Which, after a thousand years, I'm sure many Mimbari are. Yeah. And actually, if we go off the expanded universe, she's then a descendant of Catherine Sakai because Catherine goes back in time and hooks up with Valen at the end of it. And Kevin's like, whoa. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to talk about real quick is we do we did talk about the bumbling security uh, and it's not bumbling uh, is my th theory on this. And this is not something that is actually set in canon, but we do know that our good friend Jack is going to be uh, a, a turncoat and is going to take out Garibaldi at the end of this season. And I try to, in, in my head canon, I put in there that every time Jack does something really freaking stupid, it's because he's meant to. Like, the first time we see Jack in Mind War, he just lets Bester go straight to the leaders of the station without any problem. And now, as Mike pointed out, he doesn't know how to check a credit card to make sure that there's no weird stuff on it. So I, I think Jack is always, as Andrew would say, sus. <laughs> I'm old. Oh, I thought that was kind of a, it was a good story to throw in there because it's a very, to me, it's like a very law and ordery type of story about, uh, you know, an officer of law enforcement getting compromised because of his own vices being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And they managed to to compress that into a Babylon 5 sci-fi story, uh, you know, B-plot. 
which you know JMS Smart. used to write for Murder She Wrote and Jake and the Fat Man, so yeah. it all works out. Oh, that's Regarding... interesting, actually, because I think uh, wasn't it Christopher Neem was in an episode of Murder She Wrote too? I believe I'm pretty sure that's where they linked up because like he called yeah. him at the last minute to get him on because Walter Koenig was ready to uh, ready to do that act and could not do it, which is amazing that we got that chance because. We got Bester, and if it was Walter Koenig as Night 2, the intention was never to have Night 2 come back, and Night 2 doesn't come back. So that would have been a one-and-done for Mr. Koenig. Kevin, you had some. When when you see the uh, other Minbari at the end of the episode, I'm going to call him Cataract Guy. Yeah. Um, um, whenever they have the triluminary on their forehead, that does mean they're a member of Great Council, correct? Yeah, and that was kind was, of... okay. That was them making that connection. So very much like our newbies are like, was it the guy in the green, the gray council? I think that was back in the nineties. That was them showing, Hey, these guys are connected because they both have the gray little thing. Yeah. And Delenn had the same tattoo mm-hmm. with right. folder cloak yeah. back. In the flash so ball. I guess to, to, I think it was Emily who asked if, if uh, Delenn was protecting Sinclair. I think the answer to that's pretty clearly. Yes. You know, that is actually the one thing i don't like about this episode is that very uh last piece with the guy saying we have to kill him because even jms and his commentaries apologizes for that and says Mm -hmm. it was kind of over dramatic and not needed and also i don't understand how that works because it is very clear that and we see this again in uh in the beginning that mimbari don't kill over the mimbari and that is a plot point we have throughout the show they know that Sinclair is carrying Valen's DNA, therefore he is Mimbari. So the whole you have to kill him is there to make it dramatic, but it makes absolutely no sense in the canon because mm. depending on where we're at, either he is a descendant of Valen or he's Valen himself. Either way, you ain't going to kill him. They should have no. said, we'll wipe his mind. That would make that would be much better. I agree. The, the area where I'll disagree with you, and what we didn't establish in here directly, but I think from the appearance, because the way they did the makeup, is the person talking to the at the end was from the warrior cast. Okay. And so the warrior cast is give a damn. Is in season <laughs> two, when the gets booted off the great council and they replace her with Naroon, mm-hmm. you know, Naroon goes on this whole tirade about, had you told us the real reason why we surrendered at the battle of the line, we never would have done it. That is a very so good point. I think there is, so I could see if that was indeed a warrior cast member, which they had the makeup uh, with the bigger, headbone everything more in line with what the warrior cast appearance is that if he was warrior cast that he would say something like that mm. now if it was religious cast then no i'd agree with you about the mind wipe or whatever okay. but i'll give you that one plot point fixed 30 years later you fixed it good job you're welcome it only <laughs> took season two to do it <laughs> what else we got anything else? Did, kevin you were taking notes do we have any other questions predictions that we're missing you know, Justin again commented on Earth and the trajectory it's headed. He's got a hard on for Earth being Nazis. And and the thing is, and you and I have both read JMS's book. Yes. And you know, I'm I'm gonna pick up your torch here and kind of harp on the book for a minute. Please. Is you know, JMS openly admitted he wrote many of his own stories into bits and pieces of these. And you read that book and you read his family's Nazi connections across multiple fronts. And, you know, what his uh, what his father was involved in, what his grandmother and step grandfather were involved in Mm -hmm. and through these various pieces, um, it's really easy to see where he got the inspiration to write some of these roles um, because he really did. And we're going to see it more later in the series. There are stories from his childhood and things he recounts in his book that almost directly translate into scenes that we'll see later in this series. And Blake, I'm glad you you got a chance to read that. So it's not just me harping on this, but it is a really good autobiography. It's called it Becoming Superman. And if you have it in three days, yeah, it, it, Becoming Superman. It came out a few years ago, and it is you, you you think okay, it's an autobiography about a writer in TV and movies, but it is simply astonishing that he survived through the through being five years old, let alone made it to be a functioning human being, which. He even points out, to Blake, to your point, where he puts a lot of himself in these uh, characters. In the commentary for this one, he points out that 
Um, it is kind of hard for him uh, to write about Sinclair's nightmares because as he puts it, the circus comes to town a lot for JMS. Mm -hmm. And uh, he even says, if uh, you wonder why I'm on Twitter some nights really early in the morning, it's because the circus is in town and this is what I do to keep it at bay. So Mm -hmm. the man has been through a lot of trauma and we're going to see a lot of that trauma worked out on this show. What must Sinclair never find out? That he has Valen DNA, which we know actually is he is Valen. The Mimbari don't know that yet. The Vorlons do. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing I think I, I alluded to a little bit. Talking. Yeah, on that ship, which we don't know until we get actually to, in the beginning. We don't even know that in the show at all. I don't believe. Is there are two uh, Vorlons, Kosh 1 and Kosh 2, mm-hmm. on that ship. And they are first working with Dukat, and then they are working with Lanan, who is the head of the Rangers, and they are working with Delenn. And they are very much in the know of what's going on, and they know exactly how it's supposed to play out because a thousand years ago, Jeff Sinclair told them how it plays out, and they are making sure it works like clockwork. Uh, Did they men in black his ass and erase his memory? Uh, Selectively, yes. Yeah, well, and it almost fully until he was able to be jogged yeah. mm-hmm. what is the great council the the leading the leading yeah that is yeah that's a good one kevin go ahead you're gonna say it the 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 leading um organizational government uh council for the minbari people which but again the, timing... I can see the section 31 connection there too because yeah. that was the other comparison where they like the section 31 type thing and i would almost say they're both the way the minbari government's played out because you know they don't meet on the home world that was commented on um in season two about you know the great councils floated amongst the stars they're in their little ship floating around doing their thing mm-hmm. you know they're not even really on the home world it's the great councils this secret thing so i i can see it being but it is the government but i can definitely see where that other side of it is too and even back- with what we see in the great council the Lynn goes and does her own shit and other members go and do their own shit all the time yeah well that one guy was just hanging out in delay's lynn's quarters for no apparent reason yeah <laughs> but uh, again with the timey-wimey stuff the great council is created by jeffrey sinclair he creates it when he goes back in time with b4 he grabs three worker class members three religious cast members and three warrior cast members and says you are the council congrats although wasn't there an episode they were talking about where there were no worker cast members in the in the great council at this point in time there I think that was a JMS production thing. They did reference okay. that the council was the worker, was the religious cast and the warrior cast. Yeah, I know they changed um, it later, but and then they kind of retconned it later and added in that third cast with the worker right. that came in in season two. But at this point in season one, no, you're right. They've only referenced the two casts at mm-hmm. this point. Yeah, that was a couple episodes ago, and I didn't even bring that up. But you're right that they did actually. That was a goof because truly, I mean, it is three because we, when we go back, Valen reveals himself to all three. Mm-hmm. and that's why the membari are really hard up on triangles they love their triangles uh prediction from justin earth is on a bad trajectory towards violence and hatred uh yes. maybe <laughs> <laughs> i'm looking forward and, to you know the other thing that was brought up too along those lines is the question was is this going to keep happening is sinclair going to keep questioned be questioned and we have eyes coming up very soon oh i love that which episode. is uh, Freedom, uh, good. with jeffrey combs yeah the one the one time we get jeffrey combs in the show so yeah uh i think eyes is going to be the next one where we really have that happen I but we also think have that's my favorite episode of this this, uh, this season, season. it's yeah, a good one i love eyes it's so good but jms is very much a big fan of those episodes that are very claustrophobic and one-on-one and people questioning each other because of course one of my favorite episodes is come the inquisitor with yeah, good old jack incredibly good and that will be happening in a later season same idea though does sinclair know he may be married to delenn no i don't think they're married and scott come the inquisitor is not actually that it's into season two so that one's is it cool. okay yeah, yeah it's because yeah. it's before it's before all the proverbial crap hits the fan yeah right. i love that episode just remember me as Jack. I'm surprised nobody picked up on the headline about uh, is there something lurking in hyperspace? Because we know that, yes. There yes, there <laughs> is. Quite a bit in, in yeah. hyperspace. I, and I, I just watched the episode where the uh, the exploration ship is uh, is 
stuck in hyperspace last i love that episode too that one was really good speaking of hyperspace the one thing i'm noticing in this slow burn watch through season one because i always blow through season one i always remember the rate the uh the raiders being a much bigger part of season one and they've only been mentioned once so far and which is fine because they're really annoying and i look forward to when they actually get killed by shadows but i actually remember them being a much bigger part of season one than what they are and i'm sure that will happen more in the end of season one but interesting to me that that's the case my selective memory it's really more early season two that the raiders pick up is it is that what it is Mm -hmm. see this is like i said uh, this is this is where I'm, i'm a little different here i i I, I have binged this show a lot, but I haven't binged it since before the pandemic, and I am watching it with the newbies now. So even I'm kind of like my timelines are a little goofy at the moment. Did Delenn know Sinclair before his capture on the Mbari warship? Nope. No. Uh, Delenn didn't even know what humans looked like. Right. Uh, I think that's it of cre- uh, questions and predictions. Cool. Anything else you guys want to add? I'm really excited to see that this is the first episode where I think we had unanimous we liked it. Um, even John climbed off the hate chain, probably because Ivan Ivanova wasn't there, but it, you well, know. they never mentioned Londo wasn't in it either. One thing I didn't mention when the newbies were around, but I'll say it now. I think it's really interesting how they did some character development with Sinclair showing that he does find it very difficult not to harbor very bad feelings towards the Minbari. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting because you don't ever get that impression until he says that in this episode. Wanted to strangle every Mimbari you saw, which can you blame him? No, not at all. I mean, it's clear that anyone at the battle of the line probably has some, you know, PTSD and he clearly is not uh, immune to that. And I bet you he wants to strangle anyone who comes up to him and questions the war either. I just, I get, I, I think that's being played up really well is the idea. Again, I brought this up already, but the veterans coming home and then people trying to pretend they're generals and know exactly what they would have done and how they would have fixed things. And I'm sure it's frustrating as hell. Armchair generals. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, it sounds like that's about it. Uh, we will go ahead and wrap it up there. So until next time, when we talk about Death Walker. Uh, I have been Scott, and with me has been Blake, Mike, and Kevin. Just and... wait until after Death Walker, and we get to the wonderful episodes of Believers, and eventually TKO. I want to see our Star Trek fans, especially Emily. I want to see her head explode with Believers. Yeah, I think that's going to be a fun one. We were outnumbered and outgunned. We never had a chance. You say we could have won, but you weren't there. You didn't see them. When I looked at those ships, I i didn't just see my death. I saw the death of the whole damn human race. Then why did they surrender? I don't know. Maybe the universe blinked. Maybe God changed his mind. All I know is that we got a second chance.